Is your magic meter running low? Well, we've got a cure for you. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, I have Chris Reed joining me to discuss the often overlooked storylines behind Dinoland USA in Disney's Animal Kingdom. If you've visited Walt Disney World, you've probably heard Chris's voice in various places all around the resort, but one of his biggest gigs was as the voice of WDNO Radio as part of Donald's Dino Bash. So hop in your time, Rover, and get ready for a Dino Might episode coming Coming your way right after this. Before we get to today's main segment, I want to give a shout out to members of the DCTC community. These folks went over to patreon.com slash DisneyCTC to check out all of the rewards available to them while also helping to support the show and allowing me to produce more free episodes of Disney Coast to Coast. So a huge thank you to Monet, Philip, Diego, Rio, Jared, Gerardo, Anna, Jeffrey, Bonnie, Faith, Leah, Jeanette, Joshua, Skyler, and Sarah. Thank you all so much for becoming part of the DCTC community over at patreon.com slash DisneyCTC. If you'd like to join this fabulous group of people, earn rewards, and become part of the DCTC community, visit patreon.com slash D-I-Z-N-E-Y-C-T-C. It's time to dive into today's Disney Dialogue. Hello, Chris, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Thank you for joining me today to talk about Dinoland USA. Jeff, thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very excited. I'm very passionate about Dinoland USA, so this is very, very cool. Yeah. Excellent. And why don't you let some folks know, because folks, if you're listening right now and you're like, ooh, that voice, that voice sounds so familiar... What are some of the places in Walt Disney World where people can hear your voice? Yeah, I, usually at Walt Disney World is at the parties. Now, at right now, there's not a lot of parties going on, so to speak, with the DJs. Uh, but in Walt Disney World, I've been heard uh, in the Magic Kingdom at Cosmic Ray Starlight Cafe, during Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party, uh, Frontierland on July 4th, Epcot on New Year's Eve, Studios, Disney's Hollywood Studios over at... Um, when was that? That the frozen summer after party oh, yeah. from right a few years yeah. ago, uh, and then and th- the longest running one was in Dinoland USA at um, at well, in Dinoland USA Chester and Hester's Dinorama at the big party that they had there Donald's Dino Bash. Excellent, and we'll get to that, of course. But I, you know, I wanted to talk about this subject matter today for a few reasons. Number one, there, is, you know, recently they did announce that Primeval World has been closed forever. So there is that. But also, I wanted to talk about this because I, even myself, in the past on this show, have given a lot of crap to Dino Land USA, most specifically Dino Rama, and. I was, you know, I started to think about it and started to research it and stuff. And be like, okay, let's let's really look into this and what the purpose or the story behind this whole land is. Because to me, it always felt kind of all over the place. But the reality is, there is so much thought that went into this land. And I'm not saying it forgives everything I've given it crap about, but it does justify quite a bit of it. So before we actually get into the story, I just kind of want to know your overall thoughts on Dinoland USA. Yeah, you know, and I've been there many, many times. I went uh, with my parents and my sister back in the, well, really right when it opened, right when Animal Kingdom opened in uh, in 98 and, and such. We were there in 99 for the first time. And I remember thinking like, this is so different than the rest of Disney. There's, there's cracked concrete and it's very hokey. And why would I go on a carnival style adventure when I, when we got Disney, Walt Disney World here, you know, why would I want to just do, like pay for a game or just, just seemed really out of place. And so as the trips progressed, I was, and I grew up and I went on my own or with friends or family, other family. I, 
was like avoiding Dino Land. Like I didn't really care to go there just because it was so hokey and like we'd we'd go to Dinosaur and then we'd leave. It'd just be like, well, I don't like this this whole Chester and Hester just doesn't make sense. And I think a lot of people there's a stigma about Chester and Hester that is people are just like what is this? And they don't understand it. And a lot of people don't give it a chance. I am 100% in that category of go ride dinosaur and then get out of there. It's like a pathway to everything else. So, uh, so yeah, for me, I just remember, you know, dinosaur originally countdown to extinction. Yeah. That, th- that just always felt so out of place in its own land because that Dino Institute looks so much, you know, more modern than everything else in that area. I was like, what? I don't understand this. And, you know, once doing, now that I've done some research, I'm like, oh, that's actually quite brilliant. So we'll get into that. And then Chester and Hester's Dinorama, the thing that really got me with that was it felt exactly what like what Walt Disney was trying to avoid when building Disneyland. And that's really and honestly like that's still the case even though they've worked it in storyline-wise so that it's cohesive it, in reality it's still that case I would say. The other thing about it is like I'm a huge dinosaur fan. So just thinking back on it I'm like this should be a land I want to spend a ton of time in and frankly I never have but now after doing this research I'm like my gosh I could spend an entire day in this one land and really you know get some like nice details and stuff. And the other thing it's it's kind of weird to say this but like to me, Universal Studios kind of owns dinosaurs. If that makes sense, right? They've got it totally does. Yeah, yeah they've yeah, got the greatest the dinosaur Park. franchise of all time in Jurassic yeah. Park and Jurassic World. So I don't know. It's kind of like you know Disney trying to make a, a shark attraction and not comparing it to Jaws. You know, so yeah. there's that as well. And it's just always felt like a place to me that. The Imagineers would be like, oh, God, please don't put me on a Dino Land project. Please, no. <laughs> like, you know, which <laughs> is completely unfair. And maybe some of them did feel that way. But I will say that they took that challenge and they ran with it and they created a pretty incredible story when it comes to it. And, you know, there have been changes through the years and stuff like that. But um, let's just start at the very beginning because I'll mention that I got a lot of this information from some articles on allears.net. They had some very, very good in-depth articles. So if you want to learn even more about this, I would say uh, definitely check that out. So the story is that it's located along the fictional Diggs County on Route 498. And in 1946, before it was known for dinosaurs, it was simply a fishing lodge there. So one of the things that you'll find is that a lot of these buildings and props and stuff were originally used for a different purpose in this story. So fishing lodge, that's where we're going to start. There was a gas station owned by an elderly couple named Chester and Hester. Now, I'm not going to lie, for a very long time, I thought Chester and Hester were both men. Same. I Yeah, so, so did I. <laughs> is Hester a female name or is Chester? I think Chester's a male name, right? And yeah. the, the photos that we've seen uh, that they have in the land are is a man and a woman. So Chester yeah. and Hester is a, is a man and woman. And so the, the, the time when everything changed in this story is in 1947, an amateur fossil hunter found a few dinosaur bones and then had that confirmed with some paleontologist friends. So guess what? They buy the fishing lodge and, uh, and surrounding land. And this is the beginning of the Dino Institute. Did you know any of this going in? No, not at first, not at all. And actually, it's it's funny. You mentioned the highway, and there's actually that yellow painted line in, and when I first started going there, more as an adult than as a as a kid, I I had asked whoever I was with, like, and also I should say that Dinoland's sometimes not the most busy area in Animal Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So I often I had stumbled. I thought I stumbled like backstage. Is this like where vehicles, like you know, the like golf carts go? I thought this wasn't an area that we could actually go because it it does look like a highway or a road that might not be on stage as opposed to being backstage, right? So. Yeah, it's it's an interesting little land. And the, you, the other thing about it is, I mean, it's in the park that arguably is the most detailed park at Walt Disney yeah. World, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yep. 
I've often said Disney's Animal Kingdom is not my favorite park at Walt Disney World, but I can't argue the fact that the amount of detail that's in it is impressive. And because so much of it is nature and it's made to look real, it goes unappreciated because we're like, yeah, it's a tree. Well, no, it's a tree that a lot of people put a lot of effort into to make it look like a real tree. So you've got the most ornate detailed stuff at Walt Disney World next to the cheapest off the shelf stuff, which is a a whole separate other thing, but it it's fascinating nonetheless. Now, since they started this Dino Institute in that lodge that they're transforming, the students started living there and they created a cafeteria for their needs. And in order to raise funds, they put a big sign on top of this cafeteria that was formerly the fishing lodge, and it just says restaurant. Of course, later on. That would get changed by some pranksters. But at first it just said restaurant. Uh, They also opened a little walk-up counter called Dino Bites. And, you know, as college kids do, you'll you'll look all over this land and see the words Osaurus or just Saurus added to everything. And, I mean... I, I I wonder if anybody's done an official count because I would oh, guess. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> like, could you imagine? <laughs> that reaction was great. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it would be the hundreds or thousands, but there's a yeah. lot of mm-hmm. Osauruses around there. And of course, the most famous one is probably. Oh, the Restaurant Osaurus? There we go. Restaurant yeah. Osaurus. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, so this was the kind of the ultimate prank, right? All these kids started putting Osaurus and everything, and the ultimate prankster went and put Osaurus at the end of restaurant, making it Restaurant Osaurus. When you look at the sign, of course, the Osaurus is very handmade. And this actually made me think of a story um, that I'm going to share that kind of ties into Disney these days. But I grew up in Massachusetts, and one of the big colleges in Cambridge, Massachusetts is MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And, you know, these brainy kids, these are all genius kids, kids that go there and they um they have a building with a dome on top and they would do pranks and they would put stuff up there and that would baffle people like how did this even get up there like i think once a police car was put on the on the roof next to this dome stuff Mm -hmm. but one time i do remember they took like large pieces of fabric i believe it was and they put all these different shapes over the dome and they made it like r2d2's dome (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, that's Great. that's what nerds do for fun. So, <laughs> so it just kind of reminded me of that. Uh, but, of oh. course, when we get this, uh, the news that there's dinos being dug up here, word spread, tourists showed up, and uh, they would come to check out the boneyard, which is, of course, where they were digging up these dinosaur bones. And they ended up making a kind of makeshift visitor center inside of the lodge. And uh, now, did I haven't. I don't think I've ever eaten at Restaurant Dosaurus. I don't even think I've stepped inside, to be honest. We have once. Yeah. And it, it, the, the detail in there is just like, uh, my wife and I were in Tennessee a, a couple of years back and going from where we took a trip to Atlanta and then up, we went off some highway and they had like a, a rest stop, a restaurant in the middle of nowhere. And there were license plates and all these different things on the walls and old souvenirs. And it reminded us of that of restaurant Osaurus because of all this tacky stuff on the wall, but it was really, really, it's really cool and super detailed. You could spend a lot of time in there. Yeah. And from what I was looking at the photos and stuff, it looks like it was kind of broken up into a lot of different sections. There's like a little mm-hmm. museum section, a little cafeteria section and, yeah. and stuff hanging everywhere. In fact, a lot of Disney tributes in there. I believe there's some of the Walt pictures with, you know, the dinosaurs he created for the States fair and stuff like that. Right. Yes, there is. Yeah. So, so yeah, tons of detail in there. I'm telling you, you could literally spend all day looking at the details inside of Dinoland USA. And, you know, now this is something I didn't know. I did go to Disney's Animal Kingdom opening year, but I, even back then, wasn't spending a ton of time in Dinoland USA because Chester and Hester's Dinorama wasn't there originally. Instead, it was an area called the Dinosaur Jubilee which kind of housed larger dinosaur bone exhibits. And um, and this took place on Chester and Hester's land, 
which would eventually become Dinorama. But back then, I don't I have no memory of that. You said you went in 99, so that would have been there. Any memory? Uh, not, no, just really, it was just Countdown to Extinction that I, that I really remember. That's okay. Out. I, you know, I remember, I liked that Triceratops top statue that's no longer there. I wonder where that is, actually. Do you oh, remember? Oh, I know which one. Yes, I do. I think we took a, fa- well, a photo with it, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. where it's the, is it an Allosaurus? Am I saying the right dinosaur name? The one that you're trying to capture, or to, to get now in the ride dinosaur. Oh, at the end. Whatever um, that is, uh, the that replaced the Triceratops. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I always wonder where that is. And I feel like I saw actually Joe Rody make a comment once on twitter or one of his social media accounts that since we know so much more about dinosaurs now a lot of those statues that we see out front are just inaccurate totally and he was like i wonder he's like maybe we'll it was comments some throwaway comment like maybe we'll go back and fix that someday i was like yeah do it do it like yeah (laughs) and then put those statues in company d and and i'll (laughs) i'll grab one yeah Yeah. (laughs) that'd be pretty cool to have (laughs) now you know they kept expanding all of these things back to the story of dino land usa they kept expanding and expanding we got like a mechanics hut which is super cool inside we got all these kind of like hand paintings of dinosaurs in the wall and sculptures made out of wrenches and stuff like that super fun super cute details inside of there and uh, then they kept expanding once again. They made like these semi-permanent tents as well. And there was just, you know, they just kept expanding and expanding and expanding. And at some point, what was once kind of this homegrown sort of organic repurposing of things, they said, you know what, we need to start raising money and take this seriously. And that is when the trustees hired Dr. Helen Marsh, who, of course, we meet in the pre-show of the attraction Dinosaur, played by Felicia Rasad. Uh, this is in the early 70s that this happened in the story, of course. And uh, she quickly purchased Chronotech, which was a company, and uh, six months later announced that the company invented the Time Rover. I, they're, they're some of my favorite ride vehicles, actually, if you want to talk about ride vehicles in, in Walt Disney World. I, I love the, the Countdown, well, Dinosaur. I, I'm stuck on Countdown to Extinction once <laughs> Because we're talking about that, but I just like the uh, like Indiana Jones over in Disneyland. It's the same kind of way, and I just think they're they're huge and they're big, and they, the way they move are just it's just really really cool. Yeah, I'm gosh, I'm trying to think back. I think the one I know a lot of people are oh Indiana Jones is better, and yeah Indiana Jones is better, but I still think mm-hmm. Dinosaur is great. I'm often amazed by the amount of people who are scared of it, which I think is very very weird like for adults to be scared of that but whatever if they're scared of it they're scared <laughs> no, I get of it, it. I get really it. <laughs> i don't I, I yeah don't know. i i remember being uh early teens and and not liking it now it's just kind of like i you expect it it's very loud and like all over the place it's a very very cool ride but i don't it's it's you, it's hard to even compare it to the Indiana Jones one but they're both cool in their own separate ways yeah i i think the thing that people really uh, take issue with maybe if that's if that's even the case is like I, I guess it's the exact same track layout there's like literally every turn and everything is exactly the same from what i understand so people for some reason have issue with that but i think it works the one benefit i would give dinosaur if i'm remembering correctly is so you were you were talking about the ride vehicle and i agree mm-hmm. they're phenomenal the one thing about it is like it's a it's a hydraulic so yeah i like that in dinosaur you never see another ride vehicle whereas in indiana mm-hmm. jones there's that spot when you're like going down the stairs and you see the other vehicle crossing the bridge and be when, at that moment you're seeing the magic right you're seeing the hydraulics mm-hmm. you're seeing that it's kind of on like a flat bed of sorts that's yeah. you know and so it gives away the secret whereas dinosaur yep. never does that and i think that that's actually a no. major pro on the side of mm-hmm. dinosaur mm-hmm. yeah it, it because it is so in the dark you know and then flashes of of dinosaurs and, and lights and stuff but it, yeah i think that's that's how they avoid that it's just it's so much of their ride is, is in the dark with flashing strobe lights in your face and stuff yeah and a carnotaurus chases your vehicle which is this real- yeah yeah that's awesome. I love yeah. that moment. That's yeah. really, really cool. So in any case, we get Dr. Helen Marsh there. Now, she brings in the time rover in a short period of time. Some people have problems with this, and they're like, I don't know. Have you tested it? Is it safe to put the public on there? She's like, of course it is safe. It's not so safe. But this brought some prestige and funding 
to the Institute, allowing them to open in this new and improved Dino Institute on April 22nd, 1978 or so, the story goes. And that is the nice new building. So like I was saying at the beginning, to me, it never made sense that we had this nice, this nice building next to this mom and pop sort of place. And that makes total sense, right? I love it. Yeah. It's yeah. Ju- it's justified. I am sold. Yeah, it yeah for sure. Yeah, it's it, the the work that they do that that the Imagineers do on some of these, not just attractions but these lands in, in you know, um, often gets overlooked. The stories usually get overlooked. People go, oh, just like put me on the attraction and we'll we'll ride big thunder mountain railroad and it's just you're just on a mine train but no there's all these backstories to this and dino land is just completely overlooked um i think people think chester and hester is a little bit tacky understandably i mean that's that's almost the point (laughs) of of that area right yeah now well the thing is is like we never we're never told these stories unless you know when it's first comes out on press days and stuff yeah it'll be published these stories but then they just kind of go away yet all the details from these stories are still there so so there's two things about this number one there is part of me that wishes there was some sort of like official book telling all of these stories some of them are more you know i I think the twilight zone tower of terror is a very well-known story right like and so some attractions do a better job than others but in the case of a place like dino land usa like in the story if you're really living in that story and you just happen to come across this this town of Diggs County, you wouldn't know the story, right? Like you as the guest wouldn't know this story because it's not like they're going to be like, Hey, this is what happened. And this is why everything's here. You don't have like a tour guide taking you around all these little uh, side highway stops. So Mm -hmm. like in the story, not knowing the story makes sense, Mm -hmm. which is stupid, but justifiable. I can't think if they have this or not, but it, it would be really cool if, if, if they don't have this for them to put a, uh, like a plaque or something, you know, with, with Chester and Hester, like with their face, kind of like a bronze plaque or something with some words saying like what this used to be just to give people a little bit of an insight into the story behind it. I, I don't know if that exists or not. I can't picture if there is one, but I mean, there are, there are definitely photos of Chester and Hester around. Yeah, yeah. But I'm talking like a plaque as you walk in, so you're not just thrown off guard but, by this weird looking. But in reality, like that would never exist, right? In real life, it's mm. it's not like a national monument, right? This, right, true. Yeah. So yeah. having a plaque would feel out of story. I don't know. It's this weird thing and but like a like a historical plaque or something like that sometimes you're like you saying what it used to be a gas station <laughs> yeah well i well sometimes up in up here in canada there's these like it's an empty like a gravel it's just a piece of gravel right now but then there's a there's a plaque of something that used to be there sure um like back in the day but it's completely knocked down but they're preserving this little area that used to be something of importance so just something something like that I mean, it's, it's it's supposed to be on the side of a highway maybe maybe it could be some i don't know i yeah i didn't come across anything in my research maybe there is but but my guess is i i doubt it but no, I, I, it, i'd like to see one <laughs> yeah yeah so speaking of Chester and Hester, though, so Chester and Hester, remember the owners of that gas station, they're seeing all of this happen around them. All this money's coming in. They're building this beautiful dino institute. And like, hold on a second. That's our land over there that they're putting these dinosaur bones on. We're running this gas station. We started selling these, you know, little dinosaur trinket souvenirs. We're making more money off of that than we are, or than we are gas. So they decide we're kicking these this dinosaur bones off of their land peacefully. Apparently, this happened, uh, you know, along with the Dino Institute, and they were okay with it. And uh, and they said we're putting in a roadside Dino Rama attraction. And uh, you know, they decided to cash in on it. Now, something that's funny about this, of course, the gasoline that Chester and Hester sold when they were a gas station was the uh, the Sinclair gasoline. Now, were you familiar with this brand at all? No, I wasn't. Okay. No, so, we no. 
So Sinclair is a real gaslight. In fact, there's one down the street for me. And uh, their logo has always been like a brontosaurus, a green brontosaurus. And in the Sinclair gas stations, they actually do sell plush brontosaurus toys. So I think it's kind of funny that <laughs> Chester and That's Hester cool. s- started doing this as well in this story. And uh, so so they decide to you know do it. They remove the dinosaur jubilee, and there was also a fossil preparation lab there as well. And it becomes Hester, uh, Chester and Hester's Dinorama on March 31st, 2002. So this is now four years after Disney's Animal Kingdom opened. So it was a good amount of time without that there. Um, I, I have zero memory. I know I, I went to Disney's Animal Kingdom at least once, probably more than once before that. But I have zero recollection of like the dino bones and everything. Neither. I like if the bone yard was there. I don't. I'm not. Not even sure if that was there. The bone yard. I remember from the beginning. Um, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's. I believe that was there since the beginning because that's where like the college students in the story were digging up their dinosaurs. Yeah. So, the thing I kind of love hate about Chester and Hester's Dinorama is like the how cheap things are as far as like you know them using license plates and giant tires as flower pots and one of my favorite details is they painted over one of their gas signs like you can see the lettering that's you know raised that says gas but they painted over it and I forget what it says exactly on it now but like it's those details that are everywhere in Dinoland USA and you're like this is 1000% how it would have been done in real life if this story were factual. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the details that the Imagineers put into Dino land is, is it seems like it's almost beyond what they've done in, in other lands in terms of backstory to it. Um, And I mean, if, and I'm not sure if you were to just walk into Dino land and, or into the Chester Hester area, you'd, you'd figure that, You'd figure that out, but there's definitely something going on because there's a, there's a lot of stuff on the walls, like you said. Uh, there's stuff on the roofs and the and and everything. It's just it's a it is a really cool area if you give it the chance. Yeah, it's the story. I think is really interesting. I mean, I always have this debate. See, I always, I think I've said this on the show before as well, but I always picture like Joe Rody walking through there and like just putting his hand up over his eyes. So like kind of <laughs> putting blinders on so that he doesn't have to see this. But yeah. at the same time, like I've heard him in interviews where he's been like, um, you know, somebody's asked him, you know, what if you get assigned to something you don't like? Because I think we all have this this idea in our heads that Joe Rody is like master Imagineer and he gets to pick and choose whatever project he wants to do. And the reality is, is no, he doesn't. And he, I think, I feel like he even said like Pandora was something he wasn't really interested in. Like he had, wasn't a particularly big fan of the film. Maybe hadn't even seen it. I can't remember the details, but he just said, but that's my job is to find the interesting thing about it. So Mm -hmm. I, do wonder i'm like okay so you do find the interesting thing obviously because you're a master at what you do but i wonder if by the time he's done if he's like convinced of you know what this is great this is legit great because we have this story that just makes sense in this world or if he Mm -hmm. does put on those blinders as he walks by (laughs) dinorama (laughs) i don't know i don't know that's tough yeah i mean uh (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure if he would or not. I like there there is a really cool backstory to this place. There 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 is. And you know, if if people would only, would would see it um and and understand it, I think it would be overall more appreciated. Yeah. I I agree. I wish the word would get out. They should put out some like children's books or something that tell the story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It'd be interesting. So yeah, those crazy details that Chester and Hester all did by hand, I'm sure by themselves. It's all over the place. They have weather vanes with dinosaurs on them. Their gas station doesn't even exist anymore. It's completely repurposed as a souvenir stand. Uh, th- they got to go. And in fact, they have some games o- th- over there, which now this is one thing. You know, I don't know if there's necessarily a quote. I don't know if there's a quote of Walt saying this, but I, I have heard many times at least this history says that, you know, he hated Midway games and Disneyland wasn't going to have those. And I mean, the reality is we do have them at Disney California Adventure now as well as mm-hmm. part of Pixar Pier and Paradise Pier before that. So they've been around since, you know, that was 2001. This was 2002 that Dinorama opened. So 
We have the dino, I don't know if they would call it Whamma or Wama, or if it's like a play on the dino Rama, but dino Whamma or Wama, it's like a high striker game. There's the fossil fueler, which is like that water pistol game. The uh, mammoth marathon, which is the ball rolling race, which I always love those. You got to roll mm-hmm. the balls into the holes and it's like yeah. the horse race yeah. game. The Comet Crasher, this is where you toss the ball into some colored goblets. And I think it's always like you always win something. It just depends on what color it lands in. Mm -hmm. Bronto Score, which is basically basketball. And then, oh, let's see if I can say this. Whack a Pachycephalosaur. There we go. Whack a Pachycephalosaur, which is like whack-a-mole, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they have those there. Listen, in the story, it 100% makes sense. Chester and Hester are rolling in the dough because let's face it, like if Disney wasn't making money off these games, they wouldn't exist. And the fact that Mm -hmm. we both, we have them on both coasts now means they're making some (laughs) good money. Yeah. It it always surprises me too, because it's like, you're already paying so much to get in to animal kingdom or whichever Disney park you might be in. And then you're, you know, you're, you're buying the food and souvenirs. And then just to play a game, then you got to pay another few bucks into it. But people obviously are doing it and you can win prizes off of it too. There are people, you know, it's a certain mindset of people. My brother's really yeah. into those things. Like, for really? some, yeah. that I, I couldn't care less about them unless there was really the thing that they're smart with is the prizes are always something you can't buy in a store, right? So mm-hmm. if yeah. they offer something that yeah. really is pretty darn cool that you can't get any other way, then mm-hmm. I would consider it. But like the challenge of it or the competition of it, I'm like, I don't care. Like, yeah. uh, like <laughs> I really don't care if I win this. So, yeah. but there are people who, you know, are just very mm-hmm. into games in that sense yeah. and will yeah. shell out the extra few dollars to, to get it. And yeah. You know, I will I will say Disney gives pretty decent prizes. I feel like a lot of carnivals you go to and stuff like the stuffed animals you, you get mm-hmm. will be hard as a rock, full of like mm-hmm. sawdust. Styrofoam. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Bad stuff. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've seen and touched some of the prizes that they offer and they are good. I'll give them that. But uh, yeah, Chester and Hester rolling in it man and then they took their old vacation trailer and they turned that into a snack stand so chester and hester expanding and of course if they're going to have this little dinorama they need a couple of rides there and as i mentioned uh primeval world is now gone officially and i don't think i ever wrote it no i i don't think so i I've done Goofy Sky School, which is very similar at Disney California Adventure. And Mm -hmm. before that, it was Mulholland Madness. And I, yeah, I don't know if I've ever done Chester and Hester's. It's just, if it were my home park, you know, if it were a park I were going to all the time, I'd probably take the time at some point to check it out. But being on vacation, being like, I have a day for Disney's Animal Kingdom. So not not a priority for me whatsoever. (laughs) And to be fair, those those kinds of coasters kind of like freak me out quite a bit those little Mm -hmm. sharp turns and stuff i'm like i always feel like i'm gonna fall over the edge i do them but they're not like my favorite at all it's not just the sharp turns it's after the sharp turn then the vehicle starts spinning itself when you're going on these right the vehicle spun at the same time that's right i forgot about that about that it's because goofy sky school does not do that so yes this one spun and you know from what i understand the reason that it's closed is there it was having some repair issues and it's such an old system that they were having a very hard time finding the parts to fix it Mm -hmm. That's mm-hmm. what I keep hearing. And so it makes me wonder about like Goofy Sky School. Is it going to be similar situation where at some point it's going to break and they're going to be like, well, there's that. <laughs> so it could. Yeah. I'm getting, yeah, it would make sense. It took, it takes up a pretty good chunk of real estate. So I'm a bit curious mm-hmm. what they'll do with it. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like in that, in replacement, in that area. Yeah. It, mm, I, I mean, honestly, they'll probably put more games. Yeah, they could. I mean, it, it is close to those. Um, but then if there's only one uh, ride there, so like yeah. in that Dinorama area. I don't know. I feel like they need another ride, but it would obviously be like another off-the-shelf ride with some yeah. Disney paint overlay situation. I don't know. Oof. Yeah. I, like something like the teacups. I don't know. Something that is just like... A thing, like you said, they could paint and just plop it in there because they, they don't have a ton of room. There's a lot, but not 
nothing's for like a huge massive attraction yeah no no they need another flat ride an off-the-shelf flat Mm -hmm. ride so i don't know it'll be interesting to see but i gotta say so i you know gave this attraction a lot of crap for a long time but then i discovered there is some absolute brilliance to this attraction because chester and hester made their own version of dinosaur aka countdown to extinction because this the story of primeval world is that you're traveling through time and you're going to that same period of you know the the meteor or the comets whatever it was getting ready to hit the earth and extinct the dinosaurs my mind was kind of blown when i made this realization did you know Mm -hmm. this did you ever put two and two together the person that i went on the first time uh, on it with uh told me the story kind of in advance so i was watching for it as we go on the uh, as we rode the attraction and yeah as you come up the first ramp at the very top there's a white and black spinning spiral kind of thing that was like you know just like you're going back in time and then throughout the rest of it i mean you're going fast and you're spinning but you do see like meteors and and dinosaur cutouts on their side and they're like flying looks like they're flying away or something it's it is it's a really really cool attraction you're right it it was like countdown to extinction but a a mild version of it right yeah i think that that's really really smart that like (laughs) basically chester and hester in this story are spoofing the dino institute's uh you know experience i think Mm -hmm. that that's genius so bravo (laughs) to whoever thought of that in fact that's another one i think i saw joe rody post on social media about that i was like oh oh all right cool so a little a little bit of respect there for primeval world the other thing i love is there's another disney pun slash throw in or throwback there do you know what i'm talking about on that attraction? No. No. Okay. Well, so actually, there's two more. I'm thinking somebody... Uh, okay. I saw somebody saying that there, there are some dinosaurs posed like the hitchhiking ghosts. Uh, oh, well, yeah. Of, there's that. But yeah. also, at Disneyland, on the railroad, we have Primeval World. Right. So That's right. We have Primeval mm-hmm. World, and Walt Disney World had Primeval Whirl. Yeah. I was like... Yeah. Come on, guys. Some thought went into this. Bravo. <laughs> applause. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Totally. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. That is cool. Yeah, and I, I've seen the picture of that, the hitchhiking ghost, the dinosaurs, and they are in the exact same like photos. The one guy's got his thumb out. The one guy has his hat off. The other one's holding a briefcase or something. It's a spitting image of the of the grim grinning ghost, of the three hitchhiking ghosts, I should say. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> now, of the two rides that are in Dinorama... That was definitely the superior from what I can tell, because the other one is Triceratop Spin. Mm -hmm. It's basically Dumbo with Triceratops. Yep, it is. That's exactly what it is. Why Triceratops are flying, I don't know. You could say the same thing about an elephant, I guess. I know. The only one that makes sense is is the flying carpets of Aladdin in in Adventureland. Well, I mean, Dumbo does fly in his story. Uh, Yes, this is true. Yes, this is true. But the Triceratops is, I've never understood this one. Yeah, why didn't they make it pterodactyls or pteranodons or something? Like, there is the option. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I, I don't know why they chose Tricer. They well, like the name. I was going to say the name is. because, so you know, the attraction is supposed to be a giant top, like that toy yeah. you spin as a child. Yeah. So they like the name Tricera Top Spin. As you'll see in the name, the, the second T is capitalized to kind of emphasize that. So, yeah, you're right. It's because of the name. But I'm sorry. Let, let's think of a pterodactyl name right now. I was just trying to think of that. Uh, um. Uh, uh, pterodactyl spin. Oh, 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 there we go. Boom. There we go. And it just go, kind of goes up and down. You can kind of face the direction. Like you can tilt it. Yeah, exactly. There you go. The pterodactyl spin. Call up Joe and tell him. That's awesome. <laughs> Joe, I could tweet him right now. That's <laughs> yeah, so there funny. you go. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things we've been talking about the details in this land, and you mentioned earlier on how you felt like you were walking backstage because you felt like you were walking like on asphalt mm-hmm. and this kind of cracked uh, asphalt and the, you know, you can even see the parking, the old parking spots painted and the painted lines and everything. Mm-hmm. Now, all of this is done on purpose. This is so Mm -hmm. crazy because this is actually concrete because, you know, asphalt cracks and and ages very quickly. 
whereas concrete doesn't. So you're actually standing on concrete designed to look like asphalt and look like an yeah. old parking lot and or the side of a highway. Mm-hmm. Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is so convincing, this detail, mm-hmm. that it's, I mean, it's kind of unbelievable, to be honest. And once again, just the fact that somebody thought about this detail and put it in there. Such, yeah. so good. Yeah. And that's when I was mentioning the, the highway, like the, the road that leads up to it, it has that painted yellow line right down the middle. So like a car, lane, like a car on one side, car could go on the other side. And that's where I thought for a split second, like, am I backstage or why is there like what looks to be like where vehicles go and we were not supposed to be here? And of course, Dino Line was empty, so no one else is around. And I thought I stepped on into an area that I wasn't supposed to be in. But no, it's just the amazing detail. And I completely bought into it. Yeah. Backstage at the Disney parks, they have midway games for their cast members. <laughs> well, it's before I saw that. It was like the highway <laughs> part coming I, into it. But st- I, I, I was in it. it and then. Joe was probably watching going, look at that guy. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, think, it. he thinks he's backstage. <laughs> what, <Yeah. laughs> what a schmuck. <laughs> uh, no, that it's, you know, reading all of this and looking into this, I kind of feel like a jerk for having given Dino Rama and Dino Land USA so much crap and for not giving it the respect and the time that it deserves because I'm telling you, I really want to go spend a good amount of time in Dino Land now. Mm-hmm. You know, not just run on dinosaur and leave the land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of blown away by this story. This is an in depth story mm-hmm. and it doesn't need to be, right? Like they, no. they, they didn't have to, yeah. but they did. <laughs> And, yeah, you know. It's- yeah, I, I it, it's really cool, and and you you know, like I said, you could spend a lot of time in Restaurantosaurus on that the stuff on the wall there. I mean, my goodness, you you could yeah, you spend a whole bunch of time in there. It's just really really cool. Now there is one thing about Dino Land USA that is unforgivable, and frankly, it saddens me that they didn't work this into the story, because what is the theater in the wild doing in Dino Land USA? Yep. I mean, yeah, that's like the ultimate question. I mean, it was Tarzan when it opened. No, right? it was Tarzan. the Jungle Book when it opened. It was Jer- oh yeah, Journey right. into the Jungle Book. That's right. And then for that's right. I think you know Tarzan Rocks followed, ran for quite a while, yep. and now it's Finding Nemo the, Nemo the Musical. I think mm-hmm. when it was Journey into the Jungle Book for sure, and I think also for Tarzan Rocks, it was actually an open air theater, kind of like uh, oh, okay. Beauty and the Beast live on stage at Hollywood Studios. Yeah, but. Mm-hmm. Or Mickey and the Magical Map at Disneyland. Uh, but now, you know, they've closed it off. And Finding Nemo the Musical is a full-on Broadway-style production. Beautifully mm-hmm. done. And listen, yeah. all of these shows, I saw all of them in person. I enjoyed all of them. But why in Dino Land? Like, literally not a single yeah. thing they've done there has anything to do with dinosaurs. Um, no. I, they, here's, here's what they need to do. They need to, like, hang signs in the lobby like advertising the Dino Institute's upcoming convention speaker series or something like that, as if that's what the space yeah. is for. And then touring through town just happens to be Finding Nemo the Musical. Boom, fixed, done. <laughs> Joe, take there. it, run with it. It's a, it's a traveling musical, and Nemo is just there at the same time you're there. And yeah, otherwise it's used for conventions. That's perfect. I love that. Because yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. And I always forget that it's part of Dino Land because... It just doesn't make sense yeah. the way they have it. Now, you, one could argue Finding Nemo the Musical does feature sharks. And sharks were, yeah. you know, lived with the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. It's a loose it's a loose tie-in, but it's a tie-in. Listen, maybe. if we want to talk about loose tie-ins, perfect segue. <laughs> let's oh. talk about Donald's Dino yeah. Bash. Because, mm-hmm. come on, as brilliant as this is... It's yeah. also ridiculous. Yeah, it also makes no sense. I'll be the first to admit it, and I did some of the, the voice stuff. For it. But, but it does make sense, is the thing. Like, it was kind of genius. As, you oh. know, as time progresses, we have learned that modern day birds are dinosaurs. If you look at the science and the, the way that their bodies are shaped and everything, you know, dinosaurs are birds, mm-hmm. or birds are dinosaurs, rather. And, uh, you know, so like this idea of Donald Duck having this realization and being like, yeah, I'm going to jam with my ancestors is stupid, but brilliant. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and then he brings in like a launch pad. He brings in Scrooge, Scrooge McDuck. McDuck. He got, right. Yeah. He's got, um, 
Uh, well, Chip and Dale are in dino, dino costumes. Okay, so they're the ones that really make no sense, but selfishly, I just love them. They're like literally one of my favorite character meet and greets of all time were mm-hmm. Chip and Dale and their dinosaur onesies. Because number one, Chip and Dale are just adorable in general, but put them in dinosaur onesies and I'm sold. But it is a little disappointing that they... like. Because they did a, you know, they did a good job. All the other characters are birds, right? Mm-hmm. Who? Mm-hmm. Th- there's more than well, that, uh, right? Pl- uh, Pluto's in there sometimes, just wearing oh, like a vest. That's right. So, and uh, Goofy's in there sometimes. That's well. right. So yeah, they kind of, yeah. they kind of, uh, you know, yeah. You know, I, it's funny because the the one the the characters that would dance at the party would be Chip and Dale. Donald would, would be doing his meet and greet. And then Pluto and Goofy would come in. I would prefer to see Launchpad and Scrooge at the party because they're more like rare characters, right? You haven't seen them for years, but Go- Goofy and um, Pluto, you can see virtually anywhere else. Well, that's probably why they did it because people mm-hmm. wanted their pictures with the rarer characters, probably. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, it's come on. Did Huey, Dewey, and Louie take part in this at all? I don't think so. No. Nope. I think Daisy was there, right? Daisy was there. Uh, yep. She was, yeah. They, I'm sorry. They have plenty of bird characters that they could have brought <laughs> into this that yeah. they didn't need to make, you know, have these lame excuses for other characters. But listen, it's a thing. I got to say, that's another thing. I, I gave a lot of crap to Donald's Dino Bash, and then I went and I was like, okay, literally, this is my favorite meet and greet. And it's fun. And, you know, it was meant to be very temporary. I think it was meant to be just like a summer thing. Lasted for quite some mm-hmm. time. And frankly, I'm not convinced that it's gone. I, I know people like to say it's gone, but I don't think it is. I think it's just going to be the seasonal thing that pops up every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. It was supposed to run for the summer in uh, 20, starting in 2018. And then they got extended and then extended again for like another five months. It ended up running. Now I'm talking about like the dance party portion of this it ended up running for about a year and two months or something from like a July to the, the following September. Uh, and the signage is still up and they are still doing like, well, maybe not in the current situation right now, but they, they were still doing like the meet and greets and that, but the party uh, that would happen outside of, of uh, like in Chester and Hester's area, that's, that is gone at least for now. But the truck is still there where they had the, the stage in that. So you know, they could easily bring it back. Yeah. To me, that feels like one of those, we need to make budget cuts. So entertainment's the quickest thing. And it so was. they did it. Yeah. But once, you know, once they get a little bit more money to play around with, which will probably be a while at this point, honestly, considering yeah. the situation. But I, I I would not be surprised if, at all if that dance party is brought back. Like, let's face it, so. Disney loves their dance parties. They're oh, yeah. they're inexpensive <laughs> in the long run. And apparently yeah. they love your voice for the dance parties. So, hey, <laughs> what the heck? Uh, what's something we'd, we would hear from you over at – you were the, the voice on the radio, right, that the DJ yeah. would play? Yeah, so there was the the radio station that was playing uh, in inside some of the stores around uh, Chester and Hester and that, and uh, this would the party would be an extension of that. So sometimes, if you're listening, if you listen to like a pop FM station in the evenings, they have like, the, like a party, a mega mix. They were trying to emulate what a, an FM station would do. So some of the li- and oh, and Scrooge McDuck was the sponsor of this party. So some of the lines was like. Um, sponsored by um mcduck industries that was his thing right so it's like this party is presented by mcduck industries or scrooge mcduck and there's that lines about him and, and stuff like that that he that he is the funder he just wants you to know that hey i got the money and i'm bringing you this party have some fun on my dime kind of thing right so nice yeah very fun mm-hmm. so yeah i listen overall i this research has given me mad respect for dino land usa uh Aside from the theater in the wild, but I, I, I truly think I, I came up with two pretty good uh, explanations of what they could do if they really wanted. Yeah. And, yeah. But other than that, like I'd say good job. And I hope somebody listening to this who maybe felt the same way I did, or maybe I'm the only jerk out there giving Dino Land USA such a hard time. But like I said, I love dinosaurs. So this should be among my favorite places to hang out. In a Disney park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know. And I, you know what? I'm So I, I said that I didn't really give it much attention before. And then perhaps somewhat selfishly, once the voice thing happened, I was like, well, let me get some, like, find out some history on this place. And when I initially had read a couple of years ago now about 
all of this backstory. I thought, this place is amazing. It's just the story is amazing. It's really cool, the detail that goes into all this weird stuff, weird stuff that you're walking into. And they make it work. And it's it's definitely worth checking out, I think, now. And I, I will never go to Walt Disney World without going into Dino Land USA now. Even, Voice or not. even without a party? You'll, you'll still head over there? Even without the party, yeah. I'll be like, that's where it was. That's where it happened. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Anything else you want to add about Dino Land USA before we get some trivia? No, I, I think that's a, about it. It's just, it is, yeah, it's a must see, you know, it's just like the roadside attraction, like a must see thing. I, I, I really do enjoy it. Um, and I, I, I just wish, I know there's a fan base out there on Twitter. Sometimes if you search like a Dynaline hashtag, there's people that give it some love. Uh, and then there's a lot of people that just go, I didn't do that. So I wish those people that say, I didn't do that, listen to this and find out why they should go there. Yeah. I wish that they, and maybe they do. I don't spend a ton of time in the shops there, but I wish that there was some like really cool in world merchandise. Like I, in, oh. in, you know, Chester and Hester's little souvenir shop, if they mm-hmm. had like, Dino-rama sort of, you know, come visit Chester and Hester's, di- you know, the type of stuff you'd see yeah. on those little side of the road type of attractions. I think that would be kind of fun. I would, I would have bought all of those t-shirts, all the hats. I have looked for that stuff. I have looked for a Dino Land pin or a Chester and Hester pin, and I there's nothing. There is nothing that they sell there in the parks currently and within the past couple of years. And it's kind of frustrating because I really wanted some Dino Land merchandise. The only stuff that they had was um, a couple of plushes from Donald's Dino Bash, and it was Donald and then the two, the Chip and Dale in their in their party outfits and their dinosaur outfits i do remember also during the holidays uh i did an episode this past holiday season about the holiday opportunities in disney's animal kingdom and i remember mentioning some of the ornaments that they had on the christmas trees there for decoration had like cute little dino footprints on it and i don't know if they were selling them or not but i was like oh those are super super cute so that's something Mm -hmm. as well but yeah i think the potential for like in world if they really pushed this story which honestly like Mm -hmm. reading this stuff I really think that they should make this available somewhere. Or I guess, listen, just tell yeah. all your friends to listen to this podcast episode. Mm-hmm. I guess that's what it comes down to. They, well, like you said, they could sell it in a, in the, in one of the stores and make it like a, like a history book on the area, like bill it as, exactly. like make it look weathered and old and, and, and have the whole history and, the, and some of the pictures that you might see of Chester and Hester and, and them setting it up. That'd be really cool. I think it would be great. Anyway, folks, let's get to some trivia. Do you know the answer? Get your brain gears churning and play along. It's trivia time. All right, Chris, do you want to hit me with a trivia question first or shall I hit you? Uh, go for it. Hit hit me with one. This is going to Okay, go for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So, at the beginning of this conversation, I mentioned how this whole thing took place on Route 498. Do you have any idea what the number 498 represents? Yes. And, and by the way, I, this is a mm-hmm. guess on my part. I didn't read this anywhere, but just knowing mm-hmm. the way that the Imagineers work, and I'm assuming mm-hmm. what you just realized as well, this has yeah. to be it, right? Yeah. Uh, April 98. That's right. And that, right, that Earth Day is officially when it opened, Animal Kingdom we're talking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but April 98. April of 1998, that would be, you know, 498. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is when Disney's Animal Kingdom opened. So, mm-hmm. therefore, 498. Uh, that's my guess. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I didn't see that anywhere, but I think that that totally makes sense. And another fun fact is that the new, the new Dino Institute, where the dinosaur attraction is, if you look at the plaque of when that building opened in the story of, you mm-hmm. know, Dino Land USA. That building opened on April 22nd of 1978. That is exactly 20 years before the opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's it's awesome. It's kind of fun. So what's your question for me? Okay. Uh so it's in a couple of the it plays in the couple like in a couple of stores in Chester and Hester's area. Um the the I'm not sure the, the name off the top of my head. One of the one of the gift stores in there. Mm-hmm. There is a radio station that plays over the speakers. Oh yeah, and it's the same one. I was trying to avoid it earlier in the show. Said I didn't say it, but there's the name of the radio station. Do you know what the name of the radio? Is it like station? WDIG, like W Dig, or so close? Well, let me think. Yeah, let, it may as well be. Let yeah, me okay. think. Let me think. Let me think. It starts with a W, right? Like yep. like everything. And you got the next letter right. D U G. Nope. Uh, 
it's it's not W D I N O. It's uh, do- oh, D- very very D- very close. W D I N. W D N O. Ah, that's right. Okay, W D N O. Land Radio. There we go. That's the one. Yeah, fun, fun, fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what your voice was heard on as well, right? The party. Yeah, the, yeah, the outside the party. party part. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. very cool. <laughs> well, this was a lot of fun. I got to say, this. I, I'm really kind of blown away by all of this. If you can't tell, it, it's shocking to me. All of these details and stories. And thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And why don't you let folks know where they can uh, learn more about you, your social media, or your website, perhaps? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Cosmic Read. That's Cosmic R E I D. Uh, my website is CosmicRead.com. You can hear some of the stuff I've done at uh, Disney Parks. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, Facebook.com slash Cosmic Read as well. It's all the social medias. Oh, and Instagram. Um, my name is Cosmic Read.live. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. This is awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Now, folks, if you're a dinosaur fan in general, you'll definitely want to check out episode 609 of Disney Coast to Coast, where I chat with a dinosaur expert about the realism of dinosaurs portrayed in the Disney parks. And if you haven't listened to this past Wednesday's episode of Disney Coast to Coast yet, you'll definitely want to check it out as I have a discussion with Disney producer Don Hahn about his latest documentary, Howard, now available on Disney+. And don't forget that you can catch up on the latest Disney news every Sunday in the House of Mouse headlines. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. Now that this episode is ending, this is a great time to head on over to patreon.com slash DisneyCTC to check out the rewards waiting for you and join the fabulous folks I mentioned earlier to become part of the DCTC community. It's all waiting for you at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash d-i-z-n-e-y-c-t-c. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day. <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com.